right. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mike Patton. I'm here with my client, Jennifer LeMay, who I have the pleasure of representing as her attorney and also her daughter, Courtney Livingston. As I'm sure you all know, Jennifer's home surveillance video, the video of a dog shooting, went viral regarding an incident that happened at her home in North Minneapolis on July 8, 2007. This is an incident where uh, the two family dogs were shot by an, an officer with the Minneapolis Police Department. Since my presentation today will involve more than just Jennifer's case, I want to be clear that I also represent Dan Rassier, whose civil rights case is currently in litigation and has been since the end of March. I think unless you've been living under a rock, I assume you know who he is. He's a teacher in St. Joseph, Minnesota, who law enforcement tried to pin the Jacob Wetterling abduction on back in 2010. I'm also one of the attorneys who represents Diamond Reynolds. All of the, this case and the two cases I've just mentioned, as I'm sure you know, have garnered national attention far beyond the boundaries of our state. I would suggest that my involvement in these cases perhaps gives me a perspective a little different than other lawyers who handle civil rights cases. Uh, the thing I want to make clear to you is I've been in the mix on all of these cases and I will explain why throughout, the, throughout my presentation. And I believe that this assists me when I represent people like Jennifer LeMay because I know that some people in law enforcement are capable of, at times, engaging in conduct that, that no, knows no bounds from the perspective of audacity. I would note as an aside, we have excellent lawyers in Minnesota who in some cases have committed their entire careers with their hard work in civil cases with the partial goal of leveling the playing field for the citizenry when it comes to law enforcement. And there have been many successes. I'm happy that the DeMond family has retained an excellent attorney, Mr. Bennett, which was very smart for them to do, to, to get a lawyer as soon as possible, especially with what's been happening so far. I want to first of all talk about last summer briefly. It seems like not a day goes by, as reported by Minnesota news sources, of something negative about law enforcement in and outside of Minnesota. I'll give you an example. Just yesterday I read an article from the Chicago Tribune that a board in Cook County, Illinois, has agreed to pay a man $5.7 million for outrageous conduct by the Chicago Police Department with the state's attorney's office for something that basically was a repeat of the Central Park Five case, which I'm sure you folks know about. This particular case in Illinois concerned the 1994 rape and murder of a woman in Illinois for which four young black males were wrongfully convicted and served over 15 years in prison. That mistake has been corrected and the first payout is 5.7 million. Stay tuned for more payouts. And here we are in the Twin Cities where we probably never expected in a million years that arguably the highest profile case of police excessive force in U.S. history would happen right in our backyard this last July. How high profile? I'm sure none of you need any reminder, but Diamond's live stream went viral, which was a purely human, reflexive, guttural reaction to an unbelievable act of a police officer designed to save her life and that of her four-year-old daughter. And she has been under attack ever since from people like the lead counsel for Yanez in his criminal case. Sadly, that situation, I'm sure you know, led to mass demonstrations nationwide and the unfortunate mass killing of police officers in Louisiana and Texas. Once the basic facts in that matter were revealed, almost instantly that a good man, a law-abiding citizen, Phil Castile, was killed for no good reason. We all knew, didn't we, intuitively, that no matter how it played out, it was going to be a really bad and horrible moment for law enforcement, not just in Minnesota, but in this country. Bad in the sense that it's especially bad for good cops, and I would submit that most of the cops in this country fall in that category. In September of 2016, just a couple of months later, fast forward two months on Labor Day weekend, we found out that Danny Heinrich confessed the abduction and murder of Jacob Wetterling on October 22, 1989. 
I would submit that that's the highest profile criminal case in the history of our state. As part of that confession and the solving of that case, the warrant documents for that case were released publicly, including lows that led to the high profile dig at the Rassier farm in July of 2010, which real, revealed that the Stearns County Sheriff, a captain in that agency and a BCA investigator, savaged Dan's constitutional rights, throwing an innocent man under the bus to fool the public that the case had been solved. To make matters worse, Dan was the most important witness and the confession proved that had law enforcement listened to him in the beginning, the actual perpetrator would have been brought to justice right away rather than being free to potentially sexually assault other boys for almost 27 years. The details of this despicable conduct, I would submit the most embarrassing in the annals of Minnesota criminal case investigations laid out in the complaint, which was prepared by me and my co-counsel, Devin Jacob from Pennsylvania, which was filed at the end of March. We had a press conference last November asking the sheriff to answer some very difficult questions. Rather than face the music, he resigned a few months ago in the middle of his term, and so did his second in charge. What happens next? The Yanez trial. Two months to the day after Jacob and I filed, and it's Devin Jacob, the Rassier case, jury selection began in the manslaughter trial of Geronimo Yanez. Ladies and gentlemen, if there was ever a case that made the, clear the importance of body cams and why every police officer in this nation should always wear body cams, activated in the field with audio, it was that case. Here's the problem that we are seeing and will continue to see in the demand case. If technology such as body cams and squad cams are not activated, it gives law enforcement wiggle room to opine incorrect facts, whether intentional or unintentional. For example, Nora's partner has apparently opined in a BCA interview he heard a loud sound before Justine was killed. Why should anyone believe that in light of cases like Walter Scott in South Carolina or Laquan McDonald in Chicago? It could be true, but we don't have any viable corroboration. I was in the courtroom when Officer Yanez testified. And I want you to understand that I, along with my co-counsel, actually attended prep meetings with Diamond and the prosecution team. So I'm somebody that was right in the mix of that case. I know that case intimately. As you know, I assume Yanez did not have a body cam. There's never been an explanation that I know of as to why he didn't have a body cam on in the field. Even though Phil Castile said as he was dying, quote, I wasn't reaching for it, close quote, and the, even though there was no evidence, zero evidence, that Phil was suicide or hom suicidal or homicidal, Yanez provided the amazing testimony at his trial that Phil Castile was actually pulling the gun out of his right pocket. I knew right away that it was complete nonsense, even contradicted by his own prior statements, but the jury apparently swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. And even though Yanez's guilt was clearly proven with the squad cam and the live stream, not only beyond a reasonable doubt, but beyond all doubt, the jury came back with a not guilty verdict for which sensible people know was the wrong verdict. I thought the case would just slowly die out, but then the public saw the squad video and understandably was outraged. I knew about the contents of that video, video before it went public, and I can tell you when I first saw it, it, it really, it was stunning to me how, how graphic and unbelievable it was. Then we had Diamond's interaction with her precocious, beautiful four-year-old in the back of, of a squad car. Both that video and those images went viral. And those images have become the poster images for police abuse in this country. Officer Yanez was handed a pink slip within five minutes of the not guilty verdict. I mean, I know not literally, but they basically told him to take a hike, understandably, the agency he worked for. And after that verdict was rendered, he has become a pariah, and his agency's insurance company shelled out almost $3 million within days of the not guilty verdict. My point is that verdict for Officer Yanez has not been nirvana for him. 
I would submit that for honest cops, a guilty verdict would have been better. It would have, this country and this state would have been better off had the result in that case been, been guilty. Fast forward about three weeks to July 8th, 2017. This is all happening in one state, folks. Our state. This isn't throughout the country. Jennifer has been thrust into the national spotlight through no fault of her own, like Diamond, due to the illegal shooting of her dogs on her property by a police officer who had no right to be on her property had he acted like a competent professional. I'll hit on that further in a moment. When that officer arrived with his partner, they both should have gone to the front door and asked the older occupant. Uh, two of my, my, my client's two daughters were there, Courtney and Vanessa, and, and Courtney answered the phone, uh, excuse me, answered the door. And they should have asked her whether there was an emergency. Now the one officer, I'm gonna say that the officer was Caucasian, the other officer was African American, did go to the front door and asked her questions. And it was several minutes later that the shooting of the dogs happened. The reasonable question is, well, why didn't you just ask her if the alarm was legitimate? If you ask her if the alarm's legitimate and she says it was a false alarm, you're not gonna be hopping fences and, and going in the backyard. That didn't happen and that's something that we, we think is very telling. 13-year-old Vanessa was in her upstairs bedroom and actually witnessed, looked down and actually witnessed the shooting of the dogs. Jennifer had told the alarm company four minutes after the alarm went off, she wasn't in Minnesota at the time, she was just across the border in, in Wisconsin, four minutes later that it was a false alarm. Why didn't the Minneapolis Police Department know about that? Regardless, in the absence of an overt emergency, you know, like hearing a gunshot or a struggle or something like that, and there was no evidence that there was any overt emergency, the protocol should have been to go to the front door, which the one officer did, but for whatever reason, they didn't follow through with what should have been normal and what a reasonably competent professional officer would have done. You go to the door, you hear it's a false alarm, you say bye, have a nice night, see you later. And that's the end of it. I want to give you folks a little background about the body cam video, which we're going to show to you in a minute here. Um, I had sent a letter last week. Well, actually, last week, the first thing I want to point out was the, the so-called non-public report was disseminated by the department. Um, that was a good sign, and because normally something like that in a high-profile case takes forever. So the fact that that happened, that that was disseminated, was a good sign. So what I decided to do was I decided to send a letter to Chief Harto, and I didn't correspond directly with her, but I, had, I have a, an active case with the city attorney's office, a civil rights case. So I asked one of the lawyers in that office if she would be kind enough to disseminate the letter to the chief, and she said that would be fine. Uh, within 48 hours, I received contact from another representative in the city attorney's office asking me or telling me what I needed to do to be able to access the body cam video. And the requests were reasonable. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to bore you with the detail of what I had to do, but they were reasonable. I was able to obtain the video on a CD-ROM this past Monday. Uh, I've made that available to you. For any of you that, who want to receive that by email, you just need to give me your email address and I'll be happy to do that. I can do that at the drop of a hat. Um, but there's also CD-ROM, we've burned CD-ROMs if you would like to have those. And there's something I want to be clear to you folks, from the perspective of, of my client and I, Chief Harto and presumably Mayor Harges have been 100% transparent regarding the dissemination of important information about this case. Um, I don't think it's right for me for somebody in my position to say things negative about public figures when they don't deserve it. On the contrary, if, if they cooperate and do everything possible to be transparent, I think it's important that I let you know as a press corps that they have been and they have been up front with me. And I, and I think that's good because I think the attitude should be just disseminate the information, let the chips fall where they may, okay? So that's the history of how I got that. Um, before I show you the, before my videographer shows you the, the, uh, the video, um, it's over six minutes in length. I'm not gonna play the entire video, but I want you to see, we'll, we'll play it a couple times because that has the salient detail of the shooting of the two dogs. Um, and it extends all the way through to an interview with Courtney. 
Uh, Courtney is very bereaved in the interview, and I don't want to play it for you publicly, but you're, you're going to have access to it. You can, uh, you can watch the whole thing, at least what they've given me. And it, it does go to where it ends. I think it begins earlier, but our request was just for, you know, the detail that was important about the shooting itself. So um, they were, uh, I think, should be viewed favorably in terms of, of dissemin disseminating that to me on behalf of Jennifer and her family. Um, the other thing that's strange about this, and you're going to notice it when you listen to it, the, at the top right of the image, it starts at 57 se seconds. And when it begins, you can't hear anything. You can only see stuff. Um, but it, it goes on for about 30 seconds and there's no audio at all. It, it then appears that the officer does something to the device and then, and then all of a sudden you hear sound. So for the first 30 seconds you don't hear anything and I, I will point out to you why that's significant and why that's problematic. Um, you know, I guess giving the officer the benefit of the doubt, maybe he didn't know how to, to turn the audio on, but he does seem to figure it out 30 seconds into the image that, that we have. Uh, Kirk, why don't you go ahead and play that for the folks, please? And I'll tell you when to stop and start, okay, buddy? I don't want to watch it on. I don't want to watch it. It's going to be on the screen behind you. This might be bright for you. So. Okay. Good. I've seen it five million times. I know. <laughs> yeah. That light, that bulb might be a little bright. That's the officer's gun there, you can see. I dispatched both of them. I know, I know. I can see that. Let's stop it there, Kurt. I'm going to cue it back to the beginning, folks. You hear, after the shooting, you hear the sound of a, of a girl. That's my client's 13-year-old screaming after, which is not surprising after she had seen it. But let's cue it back to the beginning and then, um, and then at this time I'm gonna play it for a few minutes and then we'll stop it, okay? <coughs> Yep, I dispatched both of them. I know, I know. Okay. You shoot through the window, huh? Yeah, I'm out, I'm out. You can see the officer's shadow. Hey, Letty, I'm going to the 
very nice walking north on the Dumont Valley. At this point, he's walking around the block to get to the front of the house. The long way. The long way. to his shoulder mic. make a few comments folks and I'll be done we'll open it up to Q&A um, it's important to note that the second dog the darker dog whose name is Rocco doesn't make his presence known until after his companion is shot and presumably heard a yelp so Rocco my hero after Siroc the first dog was shot in the left cheek ran to the danger from out of the house wasn't outside. He ran from inside the house to the outside. The dogs are able to push the door to get outside, and that's how they do it. And gets shot three to four times. The point is, and I want to be clear about this, Rocco was not outside before Sir Rock was shot. And I'll explain why we know that for sure, not just from the video images. Because my clients, I'll tell you, they knew that when they saw these images, they knew that Rocco would have made his presence known long before Sir Rock was shot. So they assumed, and we will find out correctly, that Rocco was inside. Um, Kirk, I think I'd like to show the stills now before I continue. If we could show the stills. I apologize. I should have told you that when you were up here. I, I have some still images I want to show you folks. There are some, some photographs. There's just three of them. This won't take long. This shows you the camera that picked up those images. It's not on the roof, it's right in the middle of the, and um, on this, this was this the window that she was at when she, you can see in the yeah. Video here. Vanessa was at this window and looked out and actually witnessed the shooting. And then what she recalled about the shooting was corroborated by the video. But there's the camera right there. Um, it's a really, really good quality uh, home surveillance system. And, you know, it's gotten to the point in this country where you need a home surveillance system, not, to not just to, to protect yourself against bad guys, but then also the conduct of the police. It's kind of sad that it's gotten to be that way. Um, the next image, please. 
that would have been Vanessa's view. And, as, now, and I took that picture kind of far back. She was closer to the window. And I think you can see that somebody closer to that window would have had no trouble seeing what evolved uh, with the shooting of the dogs. Go ahead, buddy, next. That is the blood on one of the carpets in the home, how much bleeding there was from the two dogs. There was more bleeding from uh, Rocco, correct? Is it? Yeah. Uh, Sir Rock was shot, was it the left cheek? Huh? Yeah, it was shot in the left cheek. It's obvious that this officer was shooting to kill, and but for the grace of God, the bullet could have gone uh, through his eye and probably would have killed him instantly. So he, he got lucky that way. Both dogs are still alive, as you may know. And is there one more image? Is that it? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Um, the, the dogs were shot at about 9.23 p.m. on July 8th. It was a Saturday night. Uh, Jennifer rushed home. She went straight to the vet clinic. When she went to the vet clinic, she was told that the family would have to come up with almost $4,000 before that they would even look at the dogs. Um, she called the Minneapolis Police Department at 11.39 p.m. and she was told that someone would call her back. At 11.51, a sergeant for the department called back. I'm not going to say his name, it's, it's not important, but the call was 22 minutes and 16 seconds. And that sar sergeant basically told her in no uncertain terms that our, our officer did nothing wrong. And it was at that time that she told this sergeant, and it was the first time anybody knew, that there was a home surveillance system. And she said when she was talking to this sergeant, she could have heard a pin drop on the other end of the phone. Um, they knew that they had a PR nightmare. They, they knew that right away. In fact, the next day a lieutenant showed up and tried to calm things down and it, it didn't work real well. Um, now the point you have to understand about this is 11 minutes before the call from the sergeant, 11 minutes before we have this documented, um, the initial version of how this went down was etched in stone in an MPD report, the so-called public information report. And it says, and I quote, while staging at the rear, two large sized pit bulls charged that officer. Officer dispatched the dogs, causing them, them to run back into the residence. So anybody reading that report would assume, oh my God, this officer's in the backyard and two jog, dogs charge him, he had no choice. And by the way, where do they come up with the word dispatched? Is that just a word that's specific to the Minneapolis Police Department? Why don't you make it simple and just say shot? In fact, the officer at the scene, as you saw in the video, called to his partner and said, I dispatched them. <laughs> just strange. Um, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, is that description supported by the home surveillance system and the body cam? I think we all know that it's not. And you have to ask yourself, but for the home surveillance system, would the body cam have been disclosed publicly? In other words, would the department on its own have investigated this and, and concluded, you know, hey dude, you know, you shot that dog and that dog didn't look real aggressive to me. As my client said, video doesn't lie. Um, but what happens, and this is very interesting, I've given you the reports, you can't make stuff like this up, I, I dare you to. We get a different story with the, with the non-public report because at that point, the officer knew there was a home surveillance system and he presumably had seen that and then uh, from Facebook, because my client posted it on Facebook. She did it in a fit of rage, to be honest with you. She was just angry. And I suppose people can be critical of that or not critical. You can take it for what, it, what it's worth, but people in this state are fed up. <laughs> They're just fed up, okay? Especially after that Yanez verdict. And then the tragedy we had 10 days later after this situation. So what we get in the public report is he claims that the dog growls. That dog you saw wagging its tail was growling. The problem is his audio is off, so we have no corroboration for that. But then he admits in the second report, he says, the officer that did the shooting, that the second do dog, and this is a quote, did not rush toward him until after firing the shirt first shot from inside the residence. He confirms that that dog was inside the house 
when it rushed out after the first dog was shot. Is there anybody with a working brain that believes we would have gotten that description but for the existence of the home surveillance video and the body cam video? If anyone in here actually believes that and can tell me that with a straight face, I will personally nominate you for an Academy Award, okay? If you can do that with a straight face. The point is technology causes police officers to attempt to be truthful, but even here, the shooter takes full advantage because he knows in the first 30 seconds his audio is not activated. Now eventually, perhaps, a jury will have to reach a determination as to whether the growl happened. I would submit to you that with the facts, we wait, the way, way we know them, a group of Minnesotans are not, gonna, are not gonna buy that, especially when we see the demeanor of the dog. I mean, this is a dog that basically walks up and is like, hey, who are you? Yeah, who are you? Which is understandable because that backyard is his domain. The first report was false. The officer knows it, and the Minneapolis Police Department knows it. I want you folks to understand a significant motivator for us to be here, and the primary motivation I'm here is because of this courageous lady to my left, is to help the DeMond family with what they're dealing with. We reach out to our brothers and sisters in Australia to let them know the pain and bereavement that we are experiencing here in Minnesota is heartfelt. We feel their loss, and we hope that this presentation will in some way help to alleviate the pain and stress uh, that they're dealing with. But what we want more than anything is we want no more excuses from law enforcement as to why a body cam with audio is not activated when they are in the field. And you know what? That protects police officers from false claims too. My father, when I was a young teen, I remember I gave him an excuse about something. He looked at me in the eye and he said, Mike, excuses are like that thing on the back side of your body. Everybody has them and they all stink. And he didn't, he didn't say it that artfully when he was telling me that. It should not have to take the sacrifice of the lives of two people who lived in this wonderful state of Minnesota to make that happen. We'll open it up now for Q&A if anybody has any questions. Have they said why that camera wasn't on? Have they given you any excuse for that? The audio? The audio. No, we, we haven't asked though. Uh, to be truthful, we haven't asked. Um, but I think it's clear, if you see in the video, it looks like he, his hand moves up and he, he, active, he, he does something because all of a sudden it's on. My perception that he does activate it. Um, it's really, you know, I've been practicing law for 31 years and so body cams, are, it's a new concept for me. It's really, isn't it an amazing image to see? I mean, you're like, it, it's almost like you feel like you're the person that's perceiving the image you're seeing. It's almost like you're put into his body. You know, and I think that's a good thing because, you know, and like I said, and, and Jennifer, it's like, let the chips fall where they may. I mean, we have a certain perception of what we think we see and what it means in the grand scheme of things. You folks may have your own perception. I guess the public is going to have their perception because the whole world is going to see this now. And I will predict that these images right here are going, going to go viral. Uh, I, I predict that this will be viral. But the point I want to make is it's really, if you think about this, it, it's an amazing technology. Don't we know, we don't guess, don't we know that if we had a body cam activated, even one, not both, in the squad car when uh, Justine was killed, that we would really know what happened? We really, we wouldn't have to fill in the blanks. So, um, why do they wear them if they don't use them? Exactly. Why does our taxpayer dollars pay for them and yeah. for them to be part of their uniform, for them not to use them and have them active from the time they clock in to the time they clock out? Period. Speaking of Justine, obviously, you guys, I guess we could make the correlation that you're here today because something <coughs> similar happened. Absolutely. But well, what message do you have for folks who say you can't compare the life? Or an incident with the dog. That, that, well, that's a, that's a fair point, but I'm going to tell you, these dogs to this family are like family members. I'm going to tell you, that's the first point, okay? The second point is, we think it's important to convey to the public how wonderful and useful this technology is. And that, you know, here's a case where I think it's clear that we have a pretty good idea what, what went down now because of the body. And certainly the home surveillance video really helped. 
but the, the body cam video gives you a different perspective. And I, I got to tell you, I, I can't imagine there's anybody in this country that would actually believe that that dog deserved to be shot. I, but, but having said that, the Minneapolis Police Union, and again, I'm glad you folks are sitting down. This is the kind of thing that can affect your physical equilibrium if you're, if you're standing, has actually said publicly, has supported that officer with the shooting of that dog. You can't make it up. So did you want to respond to that, Hannah? She I, asked a good I question. Just, I, I look at it before she starts talking. So yeah, sure. <laughs> Sure. I look at it like this, that due to the lack of the law enforcement and following the rules, regulation, policies that they were trained to do, they've proven to us that we're not safe in our community. Now we're not safe in our homes. And then you just reiterated everything I said, that we're not safe. The lady was trying to help somebody that she felt was in harm. So we can't call 911 anymore. We can't walk up to a squad car anymore. My dogs can't play in their backyard. People can't drive down the road with their, their girlfriend and their baby in the back seat. It, it, it's proven something's got to change. If it, it if it doesn't change, I'm this where I'm at. Throw the whole police department away and get somebody new. Because I li I'm born and raised in North Minneapolis, and I'm fed up. So I know my community members have to be fed up. My kids don't go outside and play because it's not safe. We're we're in more danger and threat from the police department than we are the the random shootings that are outside. Because the police officers are trained to kill, and that's what they're trying to do is is kill. How is Ralph when your other dog? It, it's it's a struggle every day. Um, Sorak is on tube feedings. They shattered his jaw. They blew away his salivatory gland. So for life, every four to six months, Sorak is going to go in and have to have his saliva because he'll pull like a seal. Um, we How just about had the soft food thing too. The soft yeah, well, he's he started eating human food that's been liquefied on his own, but that's not giving him the calorie count, um, and it's high in sodium, so it's really not good for the longevity of him. Um, we just had Rocco at the University of Minnesota yesterday. Rocco has developed a huge cyst that she calls another whole human body growing out of the side of his neck. Um, that's from the drain being in and the bacteria being built up. His left shoulder, he's became lame on it. Um, it's tender to the touch. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for Affiliated Veterinary Services in Golden Valley for saving my dog. Um, when I walked in there and they're like, we need a deposit, and I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I'm a single mom of four kids. Okay, I, I work for Comcast. I don't make hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And since I'm a single mom, it's not like I just had all this random money in my back pocket. You know, I mean, it's expensive to live in North Minneapolis. Um, thank God for my best friend, Amber Sorensen. She just happened to be there by the grace of God and looked at that vet and was like, I don't care what you gotta do to save these dogs, save them. Um, the University of Minnesota, Rocco physically is probably at 75% emotionally and mentally. He's not there. He's very jumpy, skittish. Um, we have to take secondary precautions just because they're, he's in pain. He's a, you know, he is a big, he's a big dog. He was every bit of 137 pounds. You wouldn't know because he thinks he's a little teacup chihuahua like, a, like these microphones on the table, but he's a baby. And out of both of my dogs, he is the most emotional dog. Um, Sorak is actually in Little Falls with Caleb. He's actually Caleb's service dog. Um, and they're up there getting some R&R, &R, some recovery time. Um, I, Caleb, is, Caleb is her son. Yep, Caleb is my son. Um, I update daily on our justice for our dogs, Sorak and Rocco, with as many videos as we can. But my family shouldn't have to go through this. My kids shouldn't have to go through this. This is no different than the police walking into my home and removing a wheelchair if I had quadriplegic children. Um, the police department claimed that they never knew that there was dogs at my house. <laughs> Bring any one of your other police officers that's been to my house for my children. The first thing they say to me is, Jennifer, are your dogs up? For their protection and for my dog's protection. You know, there's a lot of people that are misunderstood about this breed, and that's the problem. You're misunderstood. Yeah, they're big dogs. But you know what? I would rather throw my kids in a backyard with 15 pit bulls than I would 15 chihuahuas. <laughs> and, and, and that's serious. And then on top of it, my gates are locked for a reason. Doesn't that tell you something brain-wise you can't get in my gates? Yeah, for a reason. I don't want my dogs getting out because they open doors. 
No. So God forbid my gate be left open and my talk dogs about, climb out the, the back door. Of, tell me about the height of your the height of your fence too. On how, how. Yeah, my fence is seven and a half feet tall. <laughs> so I can stand up to my fence and you can't see over it. But because my dogs open doors, we keep our gates padlocked for a reason. For the safety of my dogs. I don't want them getting lost. I don't want people on the north side. There's a huge spree going around. We're testing new thing to do is steal somebody's dog. So we're locked. So that should have been the first cue to the police officers like, hey, I can't get in this gate. How about I just knock on this door? No, they didn't knock on the door. We've <laughs> you seen your video. What was it like to see from the officer's perspective? I saw you getting emotional there. Did you feel like you were getting emotional from that? Yes. You can bring in every any behavior dog specialist that you want. Sorak didn't growl. Sorak didn't bark. Didn't even curl his lips. Now, being a muted video, you would see if a dog is growling. You're going to see their teeth. It, it wasn't there. Sorak doesn't bark. Sorak doesn't growl. Why do you think the officer shot, shot your dogs? <laughs> Not because he was scared. I'm just going to keep it real. Not because he was scared, because my dog is 10 feet from you. If my dog wanted to tear you up, he very well probably could have. So what's your guess? Why do you think he shot Trigger happy. Trigger happy. Uneducated. Doesn't know how to be work around dogs several mailmen that can come to my gate, to my door with my dogs, and have never been bitten. Do you think the breed had anything to do with it? Yeah. Most definitely, it's a misunderstood breed. Yeah, Look at Mike Vick's dog. 23 of his dogs were able to be rehomed. They're service animals. One of them's working on the police force. Only three of them were put down because of, of health issues. Only three of Mike Vick's dogs, and they were fighting dogs. We have one of them in Minnesota. One of them just passed away about a year ago. I mean, this, this breed is so misunderstood. If my yeah. dogs were in better health, I would have them here right now. Yeah, and I would note, Karen, that you can find all kinds of examples when you research that um, pit bulls are being used by police officers now. So I think the reputation of the breed is dramatically changing. Uh, but that's certainly a good question. But I, mean, I want to go back to you for a second. You know, it's amazing to me that here we have a situation where you have officers en route to what they think is an active rape call. And the story we're getting is that their body cams weren't activated. Then we have a situation where they two, shoot two dogs in the backyard of a, of a North Minneapolis home and the, and the body cam was activated. So um, the situation with the DeMond case, it isn't just the circumstance of that lady's death, which certainly is alarming, but it's the fact that there was no technology. Okay, you don't have the body. The first thing I thought, okay, okay, you don't have the body cam on, no problem. What about the squad audio? So now we're hearing if we can believe published reports, and I have no reason to doubt our, our media, that there, there wasn't even an activated squad cam, which what possible explanation can there be for that? Um, so uh, look, I, I've seen squad cams for years. <laughs> And they're always activated. You, typically what you'll see with an event is you'll see the officer en route and you'll, you'll see their route and stuff. It's pretty cool. I mean, you, you kind of see where they're moving. And so what, what can possibly be the explanation here except that perhaps it was inexperience? Um, I've heard and read that the, the one officer had one year of experience on the force and the other had two years. Boy, note to self there. You might want to have a situation where you have a young officer in the field. Make sure you pair him or her with <coughs> with an officer with more experience. I mean, isn't that just common sense? You don't need to have a, uh, an expert on, on, uh, on how you run, run the police to tell you that, okay? Any more questions, folks? I have two quick questions for yeah. you. In terms of when that house alarm went off, in your words, what do you think should have initially happened? Yeah, that's a good question, ma'am. Audible. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, I haven't done a whole lot of research on that yet, but normally the way it works with competent security systems is they are somehow lot, they're, they're connected with, with the agencies. So not only do you know when they, because I mean, they, they have to know that it went off, but they should also be able to know when, it, when it's deactivated. But be that as it may, look, I've had this happen in my office, okay? I drive the Washington County Sheriff's Office crazy, okay? This happens with people. They always invariably will come right up to your door and knock on the door, hey, is everything cool? It's actually now, they might be a little bit nervous, you know, because they're, they're responding to an alarm, but here, folks, I'm telling you, we have the evidence. 
This young lady right here dialogued with the other officer for several minutes before the dogs were shot. Doesn't it make sense to walk up and say, hey, we're going to actually ask you a bunch of questions, but an alarm went off here. Is there a problem here? Isn't that the first question you ask? And then communicate with your officer in yes. the backyard. Like, oh, by the way, we've got somebody but, in your back. But he shouldn't even be separated from you. He should be right with you first. Uh, so you ask that question, you, you probably get a response that it's a false alarm. And then it's certainly reasonable to ask the person a bunch of questions. You know, who are you? Show me. I, I get all that. But I mean, is, is it? And, and folks, this is common sense. Okay, you, know, you don't have to have experts on, on police tactics to tell you how to do this stuff. So much of this, and this is what I've seen in my career handling uh, civil rights cases, is so much of it comes down to common sense. You know, and that's not just in the, in the area of, of you know, the police, but, but all, all people, all different kinds of, of businesses that operate in our, in our community. Well, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, I'm, I'm scared to death right now after seeing the lady that was from Australia shot because the policeman's defense, he was startled. So he shoots through the window and kills somebody? For yeah. what reason? I mean, well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, 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 what? Okay, hold a second. Time out, time out. Yeah. To, be, to be fair, though, Pat, he hasn't, he hasn't given a statement, so we don't know what he was thinking. Although I will say this. The, the attorney for the other officer, and again, I'm glad you folks are sitting down. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. It has said something to the effect of there was a terrible tragedy, I think it was a couple of weeks ago in New York, where some idiot walked up to a squad and killed a police officer. Terrible, <coughs> terrible tragedy. Yeah. Okay? Terrible. But I mean, are we supposed to then, as, as police officers in this country, become paranoid because one time, and maybe what, 10 million interactions? Like DNA numbers? Are we supposed to think that every time a citizen comes up to the, our car, they're going to blow us away? Well, what I mean, want to act I mean like we have a lady, a, a Caucasian lady in pajamas walking up to a squad when they know that they're coming there on a rape call. So you assume that you're dealing with, and based on the description, it's clear that the, the way it was disseminated to the police was that the victim was a woman. So if you have a woman walking up in pajamas, what are you going to think? Well, you're going to think that maybe that's the victim, right? Um, I, for one, have got to say, and I think I'm probably trumping someone's question, um, the fact that it was one shot and it went into the abdomen, I think that when this all plays out, it's going to be accidental discharge. Um, had he intended to shoot and kill her and really thought she was a threat, there would have certainly been more than one shot, and the shots would have been to the chest area or the head, shooting to kill. So the fact that it was only one shot, I think we're going to hear that it probably was accidental discharge. Nice. And, go ahead, ma'am. Back to this. Um, yeah. And I know that there was dialogue with you, Courtney, and the officer, where he apologized, where does that sit with you now? I think you had a week or two to sit on it, and there was so much emotion. I didn't get an apology. I never got an apology. I was just told that it was unfortunate that he did it. It was and, never And okay. you guys will. I'm sorry, can you just leave the mic to She needs to. She never, she never got an apology. Um, it was an unfortunate situation. He loved dogs. That was the response that she got. There was never an outright, I'm sorry for killing your dogs. <laughs> Or shooting. What was your take on it when you were hearing it in that, Go ahead. In that moment? I didn't. I didn't hear any feeling. Like I didn't feel like he was sorry. I didn't feel like he was upset at himself for what he did. I just heard a. It's unfortunate. Like it was just like a everything. business as usual kind of thing. Yeah, like it was just something he's used to doing. At any point did the alarm company call you to see if there that? was an emergency? The alarm company didn't call me because I called and canceled it. So my alarm was triggered at 8.52. By 8.54, my alarm was canceled. So when I called into my central monitoring system, there would have been no reason for them to call me or any of my other four emergency contacts because my alarm had been canceled. So my alarm got triggered at 8.52. My alarm was turned off at 8.54. And the police showed up at my house at 9.18, 30 minutes after. Why would my kids think anything of the police needing to be showed up? I canceled the alarm. An alarm goes off. The report says an audible home alarm. Audible to me means a siren, screeching. I don't know if those of you that have home security systems, but there's an alarm that goes off when your alarm is triggered. And it sounds like a blow horn. That was not on. My kids were in, Courtney was in the living room, sitting on the couch watching TV. Vanessa was in the shower. She had just gotten out the shower. And Vanessa would be here today, but Vanessa's at boot camp with the Navy Sea Cadets. And it, 
we had to coerce her to get her to go to camp, to her boot camp that she's been looking forward to since she enrolled into the Navy Sea Cadets because my child is shell shocked. So because you canceled the alarm, in your opinion, do you believe the police never should have showed up at your house? Hello? Yeah. If the alarm's canceled, you have no business being on my property. Yeah. When you say canceled, you mean, is it an outside horn going off? No. The, the, uh, the horn wasn't sirening because it never went off. How did they make this right to you? They don't. There's nothing that they can do to make this right to my children, to my dogs that will deal with lifelong <coughs> injuries, to my child who has a seizure disorder, that Rocco provides her services, not to my son, and definitely not to my 13-year-old daughter. There is nothing that they can do that I'm going to be okay with because that's, that's like one of my kids. They need to. They need to assume accountability. They need to assume responsibility. They need further training. I'm, I don't want. When Jamar Clark was killed, they. Oh, we're going to get mandatory training. Where? I'm tired of your PRs. I'm tired of you telling us as a community what you're going to do for us. We live in this community. You police officers come here, provide your services, and get out of this town. We live here. This is our home. This is where we chose to live. I've been here for 33 years almost. My family's genes are throughout every end of North Minneapolis. Why should we have to leave? Because we don't feel safe. You guys aren't making us safe in our community. You're not making us safe in our home. Where can we go? So you're trying to run us all out of here? It's not happening. But as a community, we need to come together. <coughs> I, I don't want to hear your, your PR BS about, oh, this is, we're going to implement this. Why does it take my dogs getting shot? If y'all look at the reports and Chief Harto's statement, the same statement is almost identical to Jamar Clark's. We're going to get mandatory training. Where? Had y'all had mandatory training, this wouldn't have happened. How is it that you, the, the Postal Service can go in our community day in and day out and not have these issues? How, do they, how does our Postal Service not feel threatened and they're walking by gunfire and the police acting crazy every day? So either you get more experience, you get more training, or you get out. We have people that are in active service, active duty, that have served overseas in Afghanistan, that have been to Iraq, that have been in the war zone, okay? You don't see them that are legal to conceal and care. You don't need to see them just shooting random people. You, you just don't. I mean, it's control. I'm tired of the excuses. Our police officers are too young, uneducated, and they're throwing them in the field. Why? Because nobody wants to come to North Minneapolis and work. So we're gonna give any police officer that we can a job and have to sacrifice it at us, our community, our children, our community members, period. Y'all come here, kick up this chaos, and leave our town. You don't come back here unless you got to work. You don't spend your money that I pay for here. You take it back to your community where you live. I don't know. I want to respond to the... Attorney Patton. Oh, hey, Pat, Pat, Pat. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. The body cam, you said it wasn't turned on for 30 seconds after... Well, the audio. The audio. The audio, yeah. the audio was not yeah. turned on 30 seconds until he first saw Ciroc? In the, in the, in the clip that we have, ma'am, yes, it's about okay. 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you, folks. We will, we'll ask it. We'll ask it. We'll answer questions individually if you'd like, but uh, we're done. Okay.